The state of social democracy is something that numerous researchers are putting on the agenda today. Uh, through a wide variety of societal changes, social democracy is at risk of losing its core values and, and what it stands for. In this regard, it's important that we pay close attention to its relationship with populism, perhaps one of the more notable and pervasive political phenomena that might challenge uh, social democracy. Exactly with that in mind, I am having a conversation today with Sara de Lange. Let us start at the beginning and let us first explore this concept of uh, social democracy. So as the host of a podcast called Sara de Lange Looks for Social Democrats, could you tell us what exactly social democracy is, what it stands for, how we should think about it, etc.? Well, social democracy is an ideology that has been adopted by center-left parties across Europe since the early 20th century. Um, it originated as a rejection of Marxism. So Marxism believed that we could improve the position of uh, the proletariat in society through revolution. And social democrats uh, were part of the Marxist movements initially, but they came to realize that revolution was not the right way to go about social change. So they believed that through participating in elections and by implementing gradual reforms, they could improve the position of uh, the working class. And what is at the core of the ideology of social democrats is the idea that through democracy, you can achieve a more equal society. And if you have a more equal society in which the differences in income, in capital, in political power are reduced, citizens will also become more free to make their own choices. And is this something that is widespread across Europe, this kind of uh, ideology? Is this something that we see in many countries? So social democracy is one of the three main party families that uh, emerged in, the, in Western Europe um, in the 20th century. So social democracy is together with Christian democracy or conservatism and liberalism, one of the three core ideology on which West European party systems have been built. Um, but the success, the electoral success of social democratic parties across Western Europe has differed quite substantially already from the early 20th century. So if we look, for example, at the Scandinavian countries, their social democratic parties were really the dominant political force, sometimes even obtaining an absolute majority of support of the population. But in other West European countries, think, for example, of the Netherlands, Belgium, um, Germany, uh, social democrats were not the largest political movement, those were the Christian democrats, but they were the second largest. Because in those countries, uh, the working class was divided uh, on the basis of religious religion, so the non-religious working class would support social democrats, and the religious working class would support the Christian democrats. Now, many scholars argue that social democracy or maybe social democratic parties are kind of under siege in contemporary politics. Do you think that's one bridge too far or would you agree with this kind of, let's say, grand uh, statement? Either way. Uh, social how... democratic parties have been structurally losing electoral support since the early 1990s, mm -hmm. right? So in individual elections, their, their support might fluctuate, but underneath is a downwards trend. Um, and many social democratic parties have lost more than half of their support that they had at their electoral peak, which was in the 1950s and 60s. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that social, social democratic ideas and policies have become less popular. Uh, there's even a famous political scientist, Herbert Kitchell from the United States, who argues that social democratic ideals fare better when social democratic parties fare worse. And he says this for a number of reasons. One, um, all states in Western Europe have adopted some kind of social democratic welfare states, right? So the, the essence of the welfare states that we have with social benefits, pensions, uh, partly state-sponsored healthcare, they are a social democratic project. Uh, 
And the second reason why he says this is that some social democratic ideals have been embraced by political parties that do not have the label social democratic, but that have some of their basic principles. So you can recognize elements of social dem democratic thinking in green parties, for example, but also in newer socialist, social populist parties such as Syriza in Greece or Podemos in, in Spain, right? Their political program combines very classic social democratic ideas with the populism that you mentioned that has become so popular. Okay, so do, are there any kind of pervasive challenges or, or structural challenges that you see to the set of ideas rather than just a political party's success? So the, I think the main challenge for social democratic parties has been, and, and this is also why they started losing in the 1990s, that they've, they themselves have abandoned some of their core principles, right? So they've, in the 1990s, they adopted what is called the third way, which is a centrist political program that embraces capitalism, um, and only tries to mediate the, the most excessive uh, problems it creates for society. Um, it's, it's in, in a way, it is a very neoliberal project, the third way. Um, and a lot of voters did not support social democratic parties taking this course, especially on the long term. Um, so the fact that social democratic parties have abandoned their own principles, I think, is their biggest challenge. Um, they have a second challenge, which is that they find it difficult sometimes to say, uh, to take positions on newer political issues, climate, immigration, European integration, on the basis of their own ideological principles. Okay, so there are a number of challenges that they... There, they there are at least two, two ideological challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, social democratic parties are also challenged by what sort of big social uh, societal developments, right? So social democratic parties had a very loyal voter base in the 1950s and 60s, which consisted of people with lower incomes, lower levels of education, um, combined with progressive elites, right? It was an electoral coalition of different groups. Um, but our economies have changed to such an extent with the post-industrial revolution, the emergence of the service sector, uh, women partici more, participating more in the labor market and taking up different jobs than men, that a lot of their electoral base has eroded. Um, right? They don't have the same values anymore. They don't have the same political preferences anymore. So it's become very difficult for social democratic parties to maintain their electoral coalition. And if you look at the electorate of social democratic parties these days, it's mainly consists of higher educated citizens that work in the public sector, that are uh, public servants, that are teachers, that are police officers. Um, and that therefore have quite a different pro profile than the, the working class uh, that they attracted uh, in the 50s and 60s. So there's quite a few challenges or sizable challenges. So I want to talk about one, or I want to ask a very simple question, basically. Is populism one of those uh, challenges? Before we get into it, maybe could you shed some light on what populism is for you as part of your research agenda, political parties, radical right parties, Populism is a topic that you've widely covered and, and, and written on directly or indirectly. So what does it mean uh, for you? Well, I define social democracy as an ideology and I define populism in the same way. So I follow here the work of a famous Dutch political scientist, Kas Mudde, who argues that populism is a thin ideology so it's an ideology that says something about the relationship between citizens and politics, but that doesn't necessarily say something about how you should organize the economy, how you should organize your international relations as a country. Um, so it, it has a very specific focus, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a, a worldview uh, about uh, the relationship between citizens and politics. 
And that world worldview consists of the idea that there's good people, there's a bad elite, and that can be a cultural, an economic, or a political elite, um, and that elite is out of touch with ordinary citizens. And to remedy that problem, citizens should have a far greater say in politics, um, for example, through directly elected officials, prime ministers, uh, mayors, through referenda, through citizen initiatives, so that they can take back control and really be the sovereign people that they were initially meant to be in the classic conceptions of democracy. Now, the relationship between populism and social democracy is a difficult one. Right, so that was uh, going to be my next question. So yeah. what, what, is, what is going on there? Is there some kind of relationship that we can hypothesize? Yeah. So maybe to go back in history first, when social de democrats first emerged at the early start of the 20th century, they actually had a lot in common with the populists of today. So they were quite patriotic and nationalist, of course, in the context of the First World War. Mm -hmm. um, and they also appealed to the people. Uh, the, the Swedish Democrats, the Social Democrats, the most successful Social Democrats of the, the first half of the 20th century, called this the, the Folkheim. Uh, and it was really, they were really uh, standing for the ordinary citizens and their interests in that period. Um, today, that is less so. I already said that the support base of social democratic parties has changed over time, but also their elected officials have changed. They're primarily higher, higher educated. Uh, they're usually professional politicians. So social democratic parties find it quite difficult to represent ordinary citizens. So is there some kind of antagonism or some kind of issue between those two? Can they be combined, basically? Ideologically, it, it's still possible for social democratic parties to be a little bit populist and represent uh, the people. This is also what social populist movements like Podemos and Syriza show. Um, but because social democratic parties have ch changed so much in the last decades, um, they've really become part for populist of the establishment and also therefore a, a prime targets of their attacks, attacks on the system. Um, so so there, there, there is really an opposition between social democracy and uh, populists. Um, in, in electoral terms, it is less clear. It's often said that populist parties today are the working class parties of, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And therefore, that it is really the populist parties that are causing uh, social democratic parties to decline electorally, to lose voters. But if you look at who shifts from a established party to a populist party, that story is actually far more complicated. There are some social democratic parties that lose some working class voters to populist parties. Um, Austria, for example, is a good example. France, this has been documented. But there are many other countries where the support for populist parties, especially radical right-wing populist parties, actually comes primarily from center-right parties, so from Christian Democrats and liberal parties. Uh, if you look at the Netherlands, for example, the country that, that I'm most familiar with, um, it's true that the Social Democrats have lost a lot of support, but that support has first and foremost gone to green parties and social liberal parties. So think in the Netherlands, D66, but in the UK, you would think, for example, of the Lib Dems. Um, there's only a handful of voters that has left the Social Democrats for right-wing populist parties, such as the Dutch uh, Party for Freedom of Geert Wilders. So those patterns of movements of voters are far more complex than people usually think. And citizens also have sort of long-term trajectories to, through which they end up uh, with populist parties. So what can happen, for example, 
is that a working class voter is dissatisfied with this neoliberalism that the social democrats have embraced uh, and that he therefore starts to support a alternative left party a social populist party for example in the netherlands the socialist party is one of these examples um, and that he, through already supporting a social a populist party on the left, becomes more susceptible to the message of populist parties on the right and slowly moves in that direction. So um, it, it does happen uh, in some countries more frequently than others, but it, it's not the main axis of competition. It's not the case that social democratic parties are first and foremost competing for voters with populist parties. Okay, so if we then take a, we take a step back and we look at social democracy as the, as the concept, not just the parties, look at the ideology and, and more of, as you mentioned before, almost all countries in, in Europe or Western Europe at least have some kind of social democratic core or at least some, some elements to their regime, let's say. Is the regime or the, the social democracy as a whole, how is that challenged by populism or is, what is the relationship there so the interesting thing is that most populist parties support a strong welfare state. So in that sense, they subscribe to the social democratic model of organizing the state. Um, but they support a welfare state that is only uh, accessible to the native po population, especially radical right wing populist parties. So for the quote unquote, real Dutch, the real Danes, the real Germans, the real Brits, uh, and not available to immigrants. Uh, and you see this model most clearly in Denmark, where the Danish People's Party, the main radical right-wing populist party, has uh, supported a government for quite a long time. And this has led to the development of a welfare state system in which immigrants can only profit from the system. So, for example, get social welfare uh, benefits if they've paid into the system for long enough. So if an immigrant gets to Denmark, he first has to work and pay taxes for a number of years before he or she is entitled to benefits if they get into uh, social difficulties. So th they do subscribe to the general notion of the social democratic welfare state, but they transformed it in a very specific form that fits with their own ideology. All right, so both on a party level and on a, let's say, regime level, it's an intricate relationship, the one between yes, social democracy. Yes, it's quite a complex and... relationship um, where there, there's some overlap, but mm. there's also important differences between the two movements. So if to kind of wrap up uh, the, our, our conversation, if we look at social democracy as a, as a whole, um, to, to what extent should it respond to populism in order not to be eroded as some people argue, or to what extent should social democracy uh, respond to this populist challenge in order to be able to survive or maybe even go one step further, kind of get out of that downward spiral of losing continuous support? Well, I think there's different issues here at stake. So the first question is, how can social democratic parties respond to the challenges posed by new societal problems, right? Mm -hmm. So how can they deal with uh, climate change? How can they deal with immigration? How can they deal with European integration? How can they formulate an agenda that really fits their own ideology? And I think they can, can easily do that by going back to their ideological roots. So in the classic writings of social democracy, there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, connecting points that can be used to address these problems. And it's very interesting if you go back uh, to the early 20th century, uh, when the social democrats first emerged they were already struggling with you know should we be an internationalist movement that preaches international solidarity or should we first and foremost defend the working class of our own country so there there i think there's a lot of things that they can can pick up on that they have thought about in the past the second thing is you know how should they look at populist parties should they consider them a threat to a democracy or not? 
Um, and I already mentioned that the essence of social democracy is first of all, foremost, a defense of democracy as the roots to reform. And second of all, it is based on a very fundamental uh, principle of equality. And I think on the, both those issues, social democrats should take, uh, is, should, you know, con contest populist movements. Because the, the conception that populist movements have of democracy is a very particular one that doesn't fit with the, the vision of social democrats. Because uh, the social democrats really embrace a parliamentary democracy, a representative democracy, and I think they should defend that model, because that model makes citizens more equal. And the second is that within populism, there are fundamental forms of inequality embedded. Uh, because populism denies differences between citizens. It, it claims that all, that the people are the same, even though different groups in society might have different interests, but also have different positions, have have more or less power, have more or less resources. So I think that social democrats should also take issue with that. Um, and then lastly, of course, there's the electoral challenge. And it's probably the most complicated one for social democrats. Because if they really try to focus on winning back those supporters that have gone to populist parties, and especially to uh, radical right wing populist parties, they risk completely uh, alienating those voters that have gone to other parties, such as Green parties and social liberals. Because in terms of um, their positions on, on societal problems, Green parties and social liberals have the exact opposite ideas from, from radical right-wing populist parties, right? On the one hand, we have very cosmopolitan progressive parties, and on the other hand, we have very nationalist um, traditionalist parties. Um, so if they, if they really try to focus on winning back one group, they have definitely lost for the long term the other group. And they find themselves really in a, in a strategic uh, jam there that, that is not easy, easily solved and that I also, as a scholar, don't have the, the solution uh, to. Right, so thank you very much for shedding some light on this very intricate relationship between social democracy and populism and surely there is much more to be written and said about it. Thank you very much, Sarah. You're welcome. <laughs>